Hi everybody, thanks for joining. You are now watching part two of my video series on my stages, my steps of making a comic book page from start to finish. Um, so if you didn't watch part one, uh, you're here in my YouTube channel, go ahead and check that video. Um, I start with um, talking about how I break, it down, I break down a script um, and break it down into the panels that I want to use how I want to compose the page. I talk about the tools that I use, the paper, the pencils, all that kind of stuff. Um, please give me a chance, check it out. Uh, I think you, if you're here to, um, to learn some of the tips and tricks on um, making comic book pages, if you're new to creating comics, uh, hopefully you'll find it very useful. So once you get through penciling a page, you have some options. Um, if your pencils are good enough or very, very tight, very finished, it's exactly the lines you want to have and the darkness that will pick up on a scanner, you could scan it in like that and you can print it directly from those pencils if you want. Lots of folks do that these days, um, especially with using computers, using programs like Photoshop and, and others, you can very easily um, darken or adjust the pencil lines so that they um, are that solid black that we um, think about when it comes to comics. If you want to ink it, then you can collaborate with an inker. Um, great option if you have the, the opportunity. Um, an inker who, uh, a skilled inker, brings a lot to the table. Um, they will, you know, can take your lines that you drew and enhance them, bring their own flavor, and then you have a piece of artwork that's not just by one maker. It brings the best of both. Um, and if you're a fan of comics, you know you can go through history and see all the great pairings of pencil and inker and how they really um, uh, collaborate and bring out the best in each other. If you're like me and you don't have that option, then you've got to ink yourself. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to be uh, putting some inks down on the page um, that I showed in the previous video with the pencils. Um, I really want to quickly talk about tools. And this is one of the things for me personally um, that seemed very daunting uh, when I was younger when it comes to inking. So if you read all the books, you read How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way and um, various other publications, they will show you the old school uh, materials that you need. They will tell you you need a brush and you need a bottle of India ink. Um, and for me, that seemed very, very daunting. Um, I have done some painting type stuff throughout, uh, throughout my lifetime, through school and, and things like that. I'm not a great painter. I don't have, I, I haven't just haven't put a lot of time into it. Um, I don't have the same control with a brush that I have with a pencil. But if you go back and look at some of those great old, old, old school inkers, um, you know, Joe Sinnott, for example, inked uh, um, Jack Kirby for years and years on Fantastic Four and I think other books. Um, everything they did was brushwork. Uh, they, whether it was a line around an eye or um, a line around, you know, building or feathered shadows or big black areas, everything was done with a brush. Um, then as we progressed, uh, through time, some folks started using, um, uh, quill or a dip pen or whatever you want to, however you want to refer, refer to it. Pen and ink, um, was how I was taught in school, but this is what we're talking about here. So it's a pen. Um, it's, this one is, is metal. It has this little tip on the end, very old timey, right? You dip it into the ink and then you make your line. Um, this allows you through the pressure, uh, if you put pressure down on this little point, it opens up and creates a wider line or a thinner line. This is important in comics because on a 2D surface, we're trying to create the illusion of three dimensions and lighting and things like that. So um, having variation in your line weight, heavier where it would be darker, lighter where the light would be striking something, helps create that illusion. Um, so you see a lot of artists went to this kind of pen um, as time moved on. Um, I think because it functions like a pencil in a way. You hold it like a pencil, uh, you're going to draw 
like a pencil. Once you get a feel for it, um, you, you, you can do amazing things. A lot of today's, I think, modern inkers um, use this uh, type of tool. And then, of course, brushes for big areas. But um, this was the thing. Um, I've done some of this work. Again, it takes a lot of practice and a, and a hand, and it's something that doesn't travel well. So if you can imagine going to conventions or shows or just trying not to spill ink all over your house, yourself, your hands, etc., cetera, um, this makes it a lot harder than pens. So I, am a, I, I use pens, and I think you'll find more and more modern uh, current artists um, who do ink, especially ink themselves, will use um, either um, pens, and we'll, I'll get to the kind, or even computers. So you could scan this into the computer, and if you have the programs, you have the hardware to do it, you could literally digitally draw right over this. The benefit of that, of course, is that you can easily fix things without having to use white out or white paint or white ink. Um, so mistakes wise is a lot easier to fix and adjust. Um, also in the end, when this is done and the inks are done on, on my page here and dry, I'm gonna scan it into the computer anyway. So if you could do it in the computer, then you have your step ahead. Um, the downside to inking in the computer is that you, then all you're left with is pencils. So for me, um, and you'll see when we cut over, I don't always, if I'm going to ink myself, I don't always pencil a nice finished, what we call tight pencils. I did on the previous video in one panel to show you kind of what that would look like. Um, but that's something I wouldn't normally do if I'm inking my own, my own work. So I would be left with a, a very messy, scribbly, you know, rough pencil page that I wouldn't be able to turn around and potentially sell down the line because my inks are digital there is no product to sell people. Now, that is changing as well, right? NFTs are a thing um, where you're selling a digital, uh, you know, property. That's a whole nother topic. Um, so what I'm getting at is whether you, you, whatever tool you use, pens, brushes, uh, quills, computer, it doesn't really matter. Whatever works for you is what's important. Whatever puts that line down on the page is what's important. Um, so I'll talk about specifically the pens that I use. And again, um, give you an idea that there's no wrong answer here. Whatever works for you to put a line on the page is good. So when I first started, um, like most folks, you have a limited budget. You know, you, uh, I started pretty young and you're just trying to use what you have. So Sometimes you would use um, ballpoint pens, which is a different, you know, very different kind of look, obviously, and the ink isn't the same quality as, as what we're looking for here, potentially. Um, as I got more into it, um, I went to the next stage, which I see a lot of folks do, which is uh, these Sharpie uh, black markers. Um, and they come in different sizes. Um, and... I, I very early on, I went to a convention one time and I was showing my very early work to somebody and they complained that I had used Sharpies. And you can tell because uh, the pages will actually smell. If you have a lot of a lot of black areas, you can smell the Sharpie coming off them. Um, and then also it it's not a pure black ink. It ends up fading um, old Sharpie stuff sometimes turns brown. I noticed more current stuff tends to turn sort of purple. Um, over time, I guess, as it oxidates, oxidizes, oxidizes. Um, so, so the, the person who was, who was giving me a hard time was like, your pages are going to turn purple, you know, over the years. And, but in the end, um, it didn't matter. And, and his, this was, uh, there was two guys, uh, who were putting a book together. His, his art partner was like, who cares? He's going to scan it into a computer anyway. And, you can adjust it to be as dark as you want. So again, the originals may fade, but the end product will get done. You'll be able to print from it, even if you use Sharpies. Again, I don't recommend it. Um, if you want to do professional quality work, if it's something you're going to sell down the line or 
you're going to provide to a publisher as a as a sample, um, do not use Sharpies. Definitely. Um, the pen, I, so I have a variety of different pens that I use, um, and I'll go over very quickly a couple of them. And then again, point out that there is no wrong answer. Pens, a pens, a pens, a pen. And I'm constantly buying new ones that I see, trying new ones and, and adjusting what I like and what I don't like. The most common one you'll see, you see these at every convention, Artist Alley, you'll see them online when people are doing sketches and things like that, are the Pigma Micron markers. Um, they do have a, a black archival ink, it says, um, so it should not fade uh, over time unless, I guess, it's, it's exposed to direct sun. Um, they come in a variety of different sizes. I use the a zero one as my sort of base line. It's thin. Um, it gives me a good uh, contour line for all of my outlines and shapes. And then if I want to go in and thicken up lines, I use other pens. And so the other types of pens that I use most frequently are these, these Faber Castell pit pens. Uh, again, these are also uh, India ink. Um, they are uh, waterproof. Um, so if you let them dry, you can go over them with markers or other media. They also come in a variety of sizes. So this is the medium size, which is a, a, a large, thicker tipped pen that I'll use for heavy line work, whereas this is um, a very thin one. Um, so I'll use a variety of those, uh, including uh, the big... The big one, they have a big one with a, uh, a, a big marker with a brush tip. That's for coloring in solid black areas. Um, I find this one to be very useful. Um, the other ones that I use a lot that I've just come into, um, I've, I've, I've just gotten in the past year or so that I like a lot. Um, and these I do have to order online. Uh, this one is by Zig. Um, Mangaka, Mangaka Flexible fine point pen, zig cartoonist pen. It has this sort of pseudo brush tip on it that's flexible, that uh, gives you a different kind of line. So it gives you a point or it gives you a, a broader line. I like that one a lot um, along those same lines. This one is a zebra pen uh, that's the same kind of design, but an even slightly smaller and, and uh, it's a firmer tip on the end. Um, and then... Um, Lastly, um, I also, well, I say lastly, I have dozens and dozens of different pens. Uh, this is a brush pen. I'm not sure the manufacturer. Again, I ordered it online. So this one truly has a, a like a nylon brush tip, kind of like a, a, almost like a watercolor brush type. Again, really good for large areas. The ink is in the reservoir here and you, you squeeze it down as you need it. Um, nice to give you kind of that brushy look or brush brush um, functionality, but you could travel with this. You could put it in a bag, you could take it to a show, use it, and you, you're not worrying about spilling ink all over, hopefully. Um, let's see. The last thing I will talk about here as far as um, tools, and then I will get into the actual drawing, and we'll do some drawing here. Um, is white. So like I said, I'm not working in a computer. So if I go ahead and make a mistake or mess something up, I've got to fix it. Um, and that means putting white back on the page. Now, you can also add white to the page for effect. Uh, if you want to add splatters, stars, um, uh, sometimes it's easier instead of inking around an area and leaving little white um, highlights or little white streaks, it's easier to actually go in and put those back in after. So with that, you've got things like this. This is a Pentel Presto Jumbo Correction Pen. It's got a white out type of ink in it. Um, this you could get at, I think most, you know, a lot of office supply stores. This is good um, for larger areas. It's very thick. I do find that it tends to yellow a little, um, so it does sort of stand off the page because it's not quite white. Um, my favorite is the um, 
Uniball Signo White Gel Pen. Um, I like these a lot. Um, it has the most opaque um, white and, and does stay pretty white um, once it dries. Um, they have some, there's some different sizes of those. So that one is more of a medium. This one is more of a thin. Um, I've also got this. <laughs> this is that Zig uh, from the same manufacturer who makes this pen. I've got this Zig white brush pen. So it's, a again, a brush. The ink is all up in the top. You twist it, and it forces the ink down. Um, and then lastly, I even have, again, the same, uh, the black. I got the same thing in a white. So this is all white ink in here, and it comes down. This is, I found, has been good for things like splattering ink uh, for to make stars or just affect uh, stuff like that. So that's my... Those are my inking tools. Um, let's switch over here so that you can see the page. Um, and actually, let's do this. You don't need to see me anymore. So these are the top two panels of the uh, the page that um, I, I penciled in the last video. This one here, this panel here, is the, um, the finished inks. So again, this is what finished ink or finishing finished pencils look like um, at least for me uh, so if I was going to hand this to an inker I would feel comfortable that they could figure out what I was what I was getting at and then this is rough pencils that I'm going to ink here so what I'm going to do um, uh, actually let's do this I'm going to slide this over um, I was going to pause, ink this one first. Yeah, you know what? I am going to do that. And here, and here's why. Let me explain why. So this one is all finished. And so there's a lot of graphite. There's a lot of lead that's on that page, right? Because I've darkened in everything. I've colored in everything. It um, There's a lot of stuff. Being left-handed... If I go to draw, if I go to ink this one, I am going to smudge all of this. So um, typically for me, uh, I've got to work in a couple, in a couple different directions. The one thing I can never, I can't do is work from right to left. Uh, I've either got to go this way, uh, right? I've either got to go this way or this way. And for me, right, if I go this way, I'm dragging uh, my hand less on the stuff that um, hasn't already been drawn. So I am going to, we're going to pause for an edit. I'm going to ink this so you'll see what it'll look like when it's done. And then live, I'm going to do this panel so that you can see um, how I work off of the rough and sort of draw with ink um, as I go. So hang on for the quick pause. And when we come back, um, we're going to start working on this panel. Okay, and we're back. And as you can see, this panel is now inked. So, um, yeah, I, I basically use pretty much all the tools uh, or a lot of the tools that I showed you to get this done. So you can see where, hopefully, I've added darker lines in areas that I want to have pop off from what's behind them. So um, until you get further back and then the lines become thinner and thinner, right? So that's where all the different tools come into come into play. Um, and then I see I missed one thing, which always happens. There's always something guaranteed. You'll go to scan and you'll go, oh, I missed, I missed that line or oops, I didn't fix this or whatever. And again, you can Take it back out, fix it, or you can um, fix it in the computer, you know, whatever the case may be. One of the things I did find, because like I said, this is the pencils that were on this page being fully penciled, meaning really dark lines, colored in areas, every line exactly kind of where I wanted it. Um, I don't do that. I haven't, I haven't worked that way in a long time and then inked over it. So one of the things that I found while I was doing it here was... Um, that it, it, it added a layer of difficulty. Um, the large area that was all black, um, I had colored in. 
So the first thing I did is I, I kind of erased that out, knowing that it would help the ink adhere to the page better if I if I took that out. But all the other line work I couldn't erase. So the lines that were really dark in in here, where I had made them really you know thicker lines like this border line here. Um, in fact, well, let me zoom in. Let's see if I can zoom in. Yeah. So give you a better idea of sort of the the dark the thicker lines right so you can see like this line here this outline of the door is thicker than the, the grain of the wood and you know stuff like that so i had penciled this very darkly um or a thick pencil line when i inked over it so i couldn't erase it because it's a line i need to have if i erase it i, I can't see where i was going to draw so I draw the line on top and I realize you can still see a lot of that pencil through it. And then I had to try to erase the pencil without erasing the ink. And I know it sounds crazy, erase the ink, but if you take um, any number of erasers, especially more of these harder type of uh, rubber erasers, you go over this, it will pull up some of the ink and it will actually then start to look faded. Um, and so if you fully pencil and render your panel, it's going to be harder to clean it up later and erase those inks. So just a tip, um, you know, if you're, if you're inking your, your own work, you might want to think about the idea, you know, like I do here of penciling a little bit less, try to get you the right angle. Okay. So penciling a little bit less, and filling it in with the ink as opposed to completely penciling again if you're going to hand this off to another inker to do the work then that's up to them and and they may you know they've got their own tricks and their own techniques i just found it more difficult to erase the pencils you'll see from here versus this right Okay, so now I'm going to show you how I ink this, um, where I have not drawn the whole thing out completely. So the first thing I'm going to start with is the stuff in the foreground. So the three figures in the foreground um, is what I'm going to do first, and then work off of that. And again, being lefty, I'm going to work from this side to this side. If my hand is in the way too much, I apologize. Hopefully you'll see as I, as I move around um, the perils of the leftiness or maybe let me think would it make a difference I'm trying to see if i move the camera would it make a difference and help you see it better so if i move but i don't want to get too much of an of an angle to that throws it off is that yeah that might be a little better let's try that it's a learning experience every time i do a video and i learn more each time So what I'm doing here um, is I'm using that Pigma Micron. I'm using that 01. I know it is a, a very thin line and it's I'm going to end up redrawing over a lot of these lines. And that is perfectly okay. Um, I just like to have a nice, consistent, thin um, contour line to work with because I can always take a, a thicker pen and add to it after, but you can't take a thick line and then make it thinner, right? So that that's the way I work. I know there are other artists who will, um, they'll start. So if they know like these outlines are going to be really heavy and thick, um, they'll start with a much thicker pen and then yeah i get it saves it's going to save you some time um but for me that's that's just not how i prefer to work and again the, you know what i was t talking about at the top of the video really is that there's no wrong way to work so what works for me works for me and you know you may find that um, going straight to a a larger size pen um, for lines that you know are going to end up being very dark, very heavy. Maybe that works for you and that's cool. So the way that 
for me that I've come to this sort of inking style that I have. I, again, I am not, I ink by necessity as opposed to by the uh, due to skill set. So, um, I don't, I don't, I know I'm far from, uh, the best inker that, that is out there, but it gets the job done. Um, so anyway, the, the point I was making is, uh, the way I came to this style is through necessity and practice and figuring out what works for me. So, you know, I, I would do what I was just talking about where I might start with, you know, the medium pen or maybe even bigger for these, uh, close up, uh, characters in the front, um, in the past. But if for some reason I don't, I don't like it, or I want to vary the line weight more or whatever, it's a lot harder to go back and fix that than it is to do it this way. So it's just, uh, like I said, it's just the technique that I've developed that works for me. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, um, like this, watching someone's video or talking to other artists. Um, finding out what kind of tools they use, um, finding out what techniques work best for them and adapting those for myself. And so hopefully this um, will can point you in a direction um, that will help you develop your own uh, your own process and your own inking style. So you can see here, right, I'm taking those basic lines that I had laid down and I'm adding to them. Now, I I will probably, well, I know what I will do is once I've got all these contour lines done with this thin pen, I'll erase the pencils and I'll come back and I'll add even more um, line work. But for now, this, uh, this is uh, where I'm going. So let's see. Uh, next, I'm going to do the doorway. And actually, I was going to take out, I've got my triangle here. Um, I'm not going to use the triangle on the doorway. And the reason being, even though, right, realistically, it would be perfectly square, um, it's made of organic materials. You've got rocks, you've got wooden door. So things wouldn't necessarily be a perfectly straight line, like as if you had, you know, a more manufactured or a metal or, or type thing. So what I'm actually, I'm going to do these by hand deliberately uh, because of that. Whereas, like I said, if this was more of a, um, like I said, a, a manufactured, doorway, uh, you know, or you'll see when I get to the back here and I do the stuff that's inside, um, that part I will use straight edges for. But this, if I've got a little wobble, um, if the, if the line isn't perfectly straight, that's okay. Um, because stones aren't going to all be the same size. And then we'll see the inside of this plank of the first plank of the door. We'll do some hinges. Now, 
obviously right when a lot of this stuff hinges um especially when you see behind him if you figure this so all, everything that i'm drawing is going to be reduced down i know it's very big on the screen here but this is going to be considerably smaller so if that if the hinges are as i've drawn them give or take about a quarter of an inch in size i could go in and draw the little screw holes but those a quarter of an inch is now going to be reduced even further you just won't see it on the comic page so for me it doesn't make a lot of sense to go ahead and do that um, it's detail that is just going to get lost um, so I'm not going to take my time to do it. Some folks will, and, uh, you know, for them, more power to you. For me, uh, not so much. So. We've established that there's these metal sort of cast iron bars that go across the wood there. Now, one of the things I did talk about in the um, in the page uh, or in the video where I penciled the pages was I did talk about perspective. And uh, in the panel below here, I did a whole perspective grid to make sure that um, I was getting that right because I was doing a, a, a more complicated top-down view um, of that shot. So here, um, I did not do a perspective grid um and to be honest with you i you know i certainly could have um to make sure that everything was going back to the point behind him and make sure everything was was pointing back correctly but again you have to take into your right your law of diminishing returns this panel right now in full size is four and a half, uh, yeah, four and a half inches um, by roughly four inches, and it's going to be reduced down by almost half. So from four and a half to you know two and a quarter by two, the whole thing's going to be this big on a page. So you just get to a point sometimes where you have to say, you know what, it, yeah, I'm just going to fake the perspective. I have a basic understanding that everything needs to go back to the center um, to work right. But if it's not perfect, if it's not exactly scientific perspective, so be it. Um, so yeah. So that's the, that's some of the stuff to think about as you're putting together your pages. Um, how small do these do these detail are these details that you're drawing, and are they are they necessary? Um, will anybody be able to see them? Um, the other thing to think about, um, and this goes into um, your inking here as well, is with all of this being reduced eventually, um, how much is it going to um, compress your lines. So what I mean by that is I've got these little tiny gaps where I'm showing, you know, the thickness of the, of the stone here. I'll do it on this side. It's easier. And realistically, when this gets reduced, those things are like a millimeter apart. You won't, you won't necessarily be able to see that. Um, 
same thing like if I do a lot of really tiny cross hatching. Here, I'll show you on a different um, piece of paper real quick. So um, if I was to do something like this where I did these lines and you reduce the space in between them by half, you'd still probably see individual lines, which is what I want. Otherwise, I'd just color it solid black. But if I made them um, this far apart, and then it gets reduced down, you're probably not going to see a lot of the space in between, and you're going to lose that effect um, that I'm trying to accomplish of uh, this isn't supposed to be solid black, but it'll get reduced down um, and sort of turned into sort of a blobby area. So anyway, stuff to think about. Um, again, there's a million little decisions and puzzles and things that you've got to You've got to work through and decide on as you are um, as you're drawing your comic. Okay, so we are now at the um, the butler, and I've laid him out so that you've got. I, I know the shape, I know the stance, I know what his clothes are going to look like. Um, so I'm all set there. I'm going to give him a vest. Um, I have not drawn the details of his face, and that is something that I'm going to come in here and do now um, to give him so that I've got that down tighter um, as I ink. I don't want to guess necessarily with something as important as a face. And um, I just switched out. All right, and I'm going to clean it up a little. I want the eyes to be a little smaller. Um, I just switched out the lead in this pencil. Oh, you know what? I'm going to use my extra small pencil for extra small details. That will help. So, like, here, I'm not trying to draw all the components of his eye because at that distance you wouldn't see it. You, you know, his eyes are going to just sort of be, to be there. You'll see the outline, but it's going to be, you're playing more with the shadow of the, of the eye versus actually showing the eye. Now, he's not bald per se, but he's got an extremely... Receded hairline. Okay, so I think that works. I've just realized he sort of he sort of looks like Peyton Manning. <laughs> that just dawned on me that you'll I think you'll see what I've done with the receding hairline. Uh, he kind of looks like Peyton Manning to me. And I wasn't, I wasn't planning on that necessarily. That is how these things go, right? That's one of the things that makes it really fun is in my head, I can see kind of where I'm going and I know, I know what I want him to roughly look like. When you start making marks on the paper, sometimes it takes a life of its own and you're like, oh, well, that's what that's going to be then. I, I hadn't really even thought of it that way. <laughs> I like it even more, though. I like the idea of this guy looking like Peyton Manning. That makes me laugh. And here, so there's something else. When, um, when you're working in comics... You spend a lot of time at your table by yourself. And so um, I think we all end up uh, finding things 
to entertain ourselves that nobody will ever see or you know it won't really matter easter eggs or things that we put into it just to just to entertain ourselves in the hours and hours that we spend at the board all by ourselves and this is one of them so eventually if you watch this video when this book and this series is all done and you've picked it up and you're looking through you can get a chuckle because you know that the butler of this superhero team looks like Peyton Manning. Which is too funny to me. Okay, um, and I may, as much as I do like that, I think I'm going to age him a little bit. And, and the way you do that is by bringing in some wrinkles and lines that help age that face. And yeah, I, I didn't want him quite that young um, because this is the story here. You know, I'm not giving away any spoilers. Um, this, the basic story does revolve around a multi-generational um, superhero team. So over the years, your original superheroes um, get replaced by their um, eventually by their sidekicks, right? And they, they all work together. Um, but that's the general idea. Um, so here, you know, these three characters are three generations of superheroes, the original, the sidekick, and then sort of the second sidekick. So if you're, if you're a comic book fan, you know you're familiar with this premise, especially with characters like Batman, who have had tons and tons of, of sidekicks over the years, it seems, right? But the original Robin sort of grows up and says, I don't want to be Robin anymore. I want my own identity. And they still work together, but they, they move on. So there's an element of that to this. To this story as well so and then what we're establishing here is the the double doors that will be opened by the butler at the end of the page leading to the big double page splash surprise on the next two pages so that is going to be a lot of fun. Okay. And then I did do the oops that and we know there's yeah it's kind of panels in the door and there's a painting at least on this side And we don't show it, but we'll do a painting on this side as well. I can add that. Okay. 
Okay. So at this point, I now have essentially, oops, uh, I forget there's a, the checkered floor. So we'll do this again, sort of just faking um, the perspective. That'll be fine. Okay. So now that we have all of the basic contour lines in a very thin line weight, right? So now I'm going to go ahead and start to lightly erase the pencils since we're all done with those. Um, I do recommend, depending on the pens you're using, um, you may or may not want to wait a little bit longer than I'm doing to let the ink dry. Like for example, some of the some of the lines on the face um, were done with a pen that I know it takes a little longer for it to dry. I don't want to smear those lines, though I'm very impatient when it comes to this kind of stuff. But I'm going to wait and I will I'll erase the face after. I can work around that for now. So, uh, what I'm going to do here, um, again, thank you for checking this out and, uh, and bearing with me. So the next thing that I like to do is fill in the black areas um, that I know are going to be solid. And then I'll work from there on the, the outlines um, of the characters and starting to build up those those line weights and add in the um, uh, the rendering, the little the cross hatching stuff like that. Um, and this is where having different size pens is is really going to come into play, right? I I want these little points because this guy's got a real spiky kind of haircut. So I want the shadow in his hair to have those spiky points. Can't do it with a big brush. Okay. So now I'm going to do the outline around these figures in the front. And I'm going to make that very heavy uh, because I want it to pop them out. The closer something is, the darker, the more detail and the darker the outline around it is. That's the general uh, premise. So I'm using this um again this brush pen because it will allow me to get a a nice thick dark line where i want it but also allow me to do slightly thinner lines um as well if i so choose right so here and then i can have a little darker as i go so it's not it's subtle um again just because i think i'm I'm not a, uh, an amazing inker. So but it does allow you to do that. And also you'll you know you may or may not notice I'm working, as I mentioned, from right to left only because I am left-handed. And if I work the other way, I would be constantly dragging my hand through wet ink. So that's some of the heaviest lines um, that I'll have with those guys. And now, um, let's see, I'll go to here. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to continue this with some of the basic stuff. Um, so again, I'm going to edit and pause the video so it doesn't become crazy long. Um, 
and then I'll come back and I'll point out some of the stuff that I've done and then I'll take you through some of the final steps um, where I'm going and talk about the decisions that we've got to still make um, in regards to inking. So as you'll see, it'll pause for a second and when we come back, um, we'll be ready to move to the next step. So hold on. Okay, and we're back. So um, you can see there's been some additions here. So I've done um, a lot of the texture on the door to match here, but you can see that there's less of it. Um, I didn't come in with all the cross hatching underneath that shadow because this version of the door is further away from the reader's eye than, than this one. So less detail. Um, also same with the stone. I've just given it some texture so that you can tell based on the modeling, it's still the same stone over here. Um, we filled in the black areas um, of the tile floor behind them. Um, I added some of the sort of um, hair pieces that you would see right above the shadow. Um, so I've done some of that. I've added some extra texturing here. I've left this hair mostly open because the character has blonde hair, but you still are going to see there's going to be shadows creating shapes. And so that's what those are. Um, also some other um, rendering some uh, in here, some hatching here and here. That helps to create this idea that this back of your head is round, right? Same here. Um, this uh, rendering here helps propose, uh, helps point out that there's, you know, that shoulder blade area, there's muscular here. So this kind of pops out above, uh, below that. So that's the whole plan there. Now, the piece that I saved is um, that I want to show you more about is the butler and choices that we have to make about his uniform. So my assumption is like most classic media butlers, he's wearing a black tuxedo. So, but there's parts of it that are black on black. So you wouldn't be able to see it if you just drew it all in. The, the, the coat would blend into the pants if it was all exactly the same black. But that's the thing about it is even with stuff that's black, it's not always exactly the same tone. Um, you can take all kinds of stuff. I wish I don't have a piece of black fabric to show, but if you take a black shirt or black piece of fabric, you look at it in the light, some of it's going to have highlights and some of it's going to have shadows, even though it's black. It's not pure black. So what I'm going to do is color in this black tuxedo area, leaving highlights that are going to help define the shape. Uh, and again, this is where you just have to make a lot of choices. Now, the bow tie doesn't really interact with anything, so I can go ahead and just do that. Um, I'm going to, so the light, my, my idea here from the shading and stuff that I've done and the fact that he's in the last panel over that you can't see because I'm zoomed in, he's silhouetted. So um, I'm going to assume that there's light coming, more light coming from outside in than inside out, right? If, there, if this area was very, very bright behind him, he'd be in silhouette here because the light would be behind. And in the other panel, we'd see the back of him. In this case, because it's dark, that means there's more light coming this way. So the stuff that's in front, like the lapels, the front of the pants, things like that, uh, parts of the arm, I'm going to leave that highlight. So the things that are behind are what's going to get filled in first. So we're going to do this. Um, I'm also trying to take into consideration the folds of the fabric um, so that, right, the, the, the things that you would see as the fabric folds on itself, again, it's going to create shadows and depth um, that you wouldn't see otherwise. So leaving, there is light, some light behind him. It's not perfectly black. So that's why I'm leaving this thin highlight behind him, but more again on the front of the, of the clothing. And then where, like where this arm passes behind him, his own body is shading that more. So this isn't going to be perfectly um, light. There is going to be some dark on there. Do that. Fill in most of this. 
And then we'll kind of do the same thing over here. Again, so his body is going to project more shading on that arm. Uh, the door as well would be casting some shadow on that arm. I hear the top part's going to be a little darker. Behind that. And so we'll get a little... Again, more highlight on the lapels. And then this area, especially this part, right, is going to be very dark. Uh, the tails behind him until they really clear his, his body and his legs aren't casting shadows on them. So the vest could be a different color. The vest could be white, could be gray. I'm okay with that. So I'm going to leave the vest unshaded. So now comes the pants. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, um, if the light's striking the front, he's going to have much more uh, highlight to the front, more shadow to the back of the legs. And again, all, all we're doing here is um, we're making it so that it's a lot, it's easier for the reader to understand the story that we're trying to tell and create that illusion of, of depth and three dimensions. Um, if I go, if I color it solid black, then it doesn't look like real clothing that we're all familiar with. It looks just like a, just a flat piece of black on a page. Um, but we all know that, um, like I said, not everything that is black is necessarily solid black. And so um, creating these areas of shadow and highlight to play off each other adds some realism um, and a dimensionality to it. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And then because I'm kind of doing it now, I could have taken and um, I could have very easily used a pencil and I've done this at, at times as well. I could have shaded it all in pencil to figure it out first and then gone in and inked the areas that I penciled. But here I'm doing it on the fly. So um, I can add, I can subtract right, with my white ink if I really want to. Um, okay. So to me, I feel, I feel good about that. It's got what I'm looking for. Um, now I'm going to, last thing is I'm going to add some shadows from the inside of the of the room here uh, just to again add some more of that um, that depth that dimensionality hopefully that will especially with the colors right so if you if you go ahead and you make the colors um, you know a little more muted in the background a little darker a little more blue um, that will help push all that backwards um, from your nice, bright, vibrant foreground. So that's what we're looking to accomplish with this. And then we'll do a little underneath the door casing. I have not established where the light source is in this room yet, as far as... I haven't put shadows down or anything like that. Um, so it's kind of, I'm just kind of doing it at a basic, assuming that there's some 
light up above. Maybe there's lamps. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, you can't really tell. I think I drew a fireplace, or my idea was to do a fireplace in the in the room. So that would have provided some light. Um, I'm going to do one last thing here. I say, I, always say, I say that one last thing, and then I do two things. I'm going to give this guy just a little, a little bit darker outline to help separate him from the background so that you've got your very, very thick outline right up front, a nice medium outline on things like the door, and then a thin outline um, as we get to this guy. And then no outline um, necessarily on the, the pieces behind him. So we've created levels of our outline. We'll do that. We'll do this. And uh, yeah, and there we go. And then um, just looking ahead here. There's a part of that floor that's going to be, I'll do this one black. I forgot, I think it's that checkerboard um, path. Now, I did say uh, in the previous video, and we'll go ahead. So there's our, that, there's my pencil panel. Um, and let me, let me zoom back out here. Move over and unzoom. So you can see, there we go. Um, I've got two more to do to complete this page. Um, but that's the process that I use when I'm, uh, penciling a pan or inking a panel that has been done, you know, like this, where it's it's laid out, but it's it's rough. It's not finished pencils, so I'm doing a lot of the drawing work and the decision making in inks versus um, this first one here that I did, um, where I had penciled every line, shaded everything in pencil. This becomes more honestly of a of a tracing exercise to just fill in those areas versus making the decisions. Um, I did say when I drew this that I would be doing some sort of a logo on this rug, um, which I will do and then I'll come back and I'll um, and I'll add it to the uh, to the one I just did up here. But that's it for now and um, you know again, I thank you very much for checking out the video. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Uh, perhaps there are tools that you hadn't seen before. Um, my thought process on, you know, how I use uh, the different pens, different thicknesses, um, what some of the, the, again, the decision making is, is I'm inking the choice between going to full pencils and inking versus rough pencils and inking. All these things um, hopefully have steered you in a new direction and help you um, maybe feel more confident or excited about trying some inking yourself. Um, the more versatile you are as an artist, the more you can do, um, the better off I think you are. That's my opinion. Um, so go out, don't be afraid, give it a try, do some inks and um, enjoy. Thanks so much for checking out the video. I really appreciate it. Um, look for more coming out hopefully soon. Um, we're heading into Inktober, so uh, look for so on me on social media with my various uh, Inktober projects that I'll be posting. So thanks so much, and uh, see you soon.